So this chapter is going to be about how a species becomes a species, how that process actually works to become a new species. So um, remember that a species is the basic unit of evolution, right? That's what we're looking at. And we talked about microevolution previously. Now we're going to talk about macroevolution, right? And that's going to be the actual creation of some new taxonomic group. Usually it's going to be the creation of a new species. Obviously that's going to take a fair bit of time. This is not going to be something that happens over like 30 years, unless if you're talking about something that has very fast generation times. Um, so let's go back to our concept of a species. Remember, um, in 1942, Ernst Mayer is going to be the one who defined it as a population that's capable of interbreeding together and producing viable, fertile offspring. Those that cannot do this are not part of the species because they have to be able to exchange genetic information. Now, you're probably thinking in your head, wait a minute, I've heard of a liger happening, and what about like a donkey or a mule or however that whole thing works? And yeah, you're right. There are going to be exceptions to these rules, right? Um, I even put it in my PowerPoint just to show you. Oh, no, that's not the one we wanted. We wanted this one. There's our liger, right? So that's going to be the exception to the rule, right, where you've got um, a hybrid happening. However, there's going to be something that happens to them that's going to prevent them from going any further. Now, there is something out there called growler bears, which is grizzlies and polar bears that they've found that have been mating, and we'll talk about that more in class. There is something going on there that's a little bit funky. But that's one thing I want you to remember is we're learning the basic nature, uh, nature rules, and things are going to kind of not follow those sometimes, and that's the cool thing about nature. Okay, so another thing that can happen um, that will tell you that you're getting close to seeing a new species is where you have geographic variation within a species. So let's say you have one species of snake, but um, it's found all over the United States, right? Well, if you think about it, a snake that's found in Maine is going to have different environment parameters that it's going to be if it was in Florida versus if it was in California or Arizona, right? Those are completely different environments. You've got desert, you've got like, you know, temperate forest up there, and then you've got like tropics down there. So what's going to happen is probably eventually those guys are going to kind of stay in their parts of the U.S. and they're going to have different environmental stressors, so they're probably going to become so different from one another that eventually they're not going to be able to mate with one another. And that is something that really is actually happening. Oh, why is this thing just so obsessed with this? I'm going to get rid of it. Um, so that's something that definitely is happening. So here is the example I was talking about. Um, so these are all technically the same species, but what they're calling them now is subspecies. And that's because they're going to get... Um, exposed to different environmental parameters and eventually they're becoming genetically different from one another to the point where they're not going to be able to interbreed. Right now they can, but eventually they think that they won't. And so that's when you call them a subspecies. Okay, so there are going to be barriers that species are going to naturally have that I think are super cool and that helps them to maintain their distinctiveness. So that's why you don't have like a human mating with like a penguin or something like that. Okay, so there are two types. There's prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. So we'll start by talking about prezygotic and just like it sounds, that's going to be something that will keep or prevent a zygote from forming, right? It's prezygotic. So a couple of these, first one is going to be ecological isolation. So what we mean by that is because, is let's say you have a species of something that lives in the water versus a species that lives in trees. Chances are they're never going to meet, right? So if we go back here, here we have ecological isolation. A water snake is probably never going to come out of the water and go all the way up in a tree to meet this species of snake. So the chances of them even meeting to try to mate, very, very, very slim. That's ecological or habitat isolation. Um, the next example is behavioral, right? So behavioral isolation is going to be like different mating songs or rituals. Um, this picture here is going to be a bird of paradise, and that's the male that's doing his little dance that um, he's going to do for the female to get her all excited and interested in him, right? Now, when we see that, we're like, wow, that's kind of cool, but it's not like, hey, girls, I'll see you later. I'm going home with that, right? Because that's not the signals that we get, right? Um, that could also, what could also be lumped in there is pheromones that are given off, which are chemical signals. Um, that's kind of in the behavioral arena as well. 
Then you've got mechanical isolation. And this is basically if the parts don't fit, then it's not going to work, right? So even if this ant and this elephant are like, wow, I really like you. Oh, I like you too. Let's mate. Um, chances are very slim that um, there's going to actually be a way where these two could actually um, mate with one another, right? Okay. Um, so those are going to be our prezygotics. Um, one that I didn't have a picture of, but we can talk about is going to be temporal isolation and temporal has to do with timing. So, um, maybe they go into heat different times of the year, or maybe it's every two years and something else is every five years. So the timing is off. Um, and then you've got gametic isolation and that's if all those other things don't cause any problems, all of a sudden the um, gametes come together, but they don't fuse and form a zygote because of chromosome numbers or something like that. Okay. Now, the next group is postzygotic, and that's going to happen after fertilization happens. So all the stuff works, sperm meets the egg, forms a zygote, but then something happens. So there's three things that can happen. First one is reduced hybrid viability. And what, may, what happens there is you have a zygote that starts to divide, and then it just kind of falls apart. So you do form a zygote, but then nothing really happens. That happens with amphibians a lot, um, frogs and things like that. Then you've got reduced hybrid fertility. So yes, the two can mate, but all of a sudden they have offspring and the offspring cannot um, produce anymore. That's the infertile or sterile offspring. So that's what you have happen when you have ligers and tigons, depending on who the male and the female are. Um, that's what you have with the horse, donkey, mule situation. So um, that is going to be reduced hybrid fertility. Then you've got that third one, hybrid breakdown, and that's where maybe that first generation isn't sterile, but then later down the line, second, third, fourth generation, it does become sterile. So there was a farmer in the news a couple of years ago, and he was like, you know, he had the horse, donkey, mule situation going, but the offspring was able to have more offspring. But then after that, the grandkids you could think of, those were sterile. So that's hybrid breakdown. So those are going to be all the ways that a species tries to maintain itself as a species, which I think is super cool. Now, remember, I said this before, there are alternative concepts of species. So these rules are great, but they don't apply to every single species that we know out there. Perfect example is the growler bear situation with the grizzlies and the polars. They're actually having offspring that are fertile and having no problems. So um, nature finds a way, right? It always seems to find a way. So in the next video, we'll talk about um, different types of speciation and how the process of speciation or creating a new species can happen.